Good morning. We welcome you today, the last Sunday of 2023. Wow. Lots have gone on in this past year. Busy year for everybody. And launching a new year, 2024. I always find these few days just before a new year to be a good time to reflect. Reflect on your year, reflect on where you want to go and what's happening in the coming year. So it's a, it's a, it's a contemplative time, really. It's a time which invites spiritual reflection. So I encourage you to be thinking along those lines as we uh, go through this service.
Let us pray. Thanks to our Lord Jesus, who came as a baby to rescue us, we can call unto you, Abba, our Father. Today, as we come to the end of this year, we give thanks for all the blessings we receive, blessings in the shape of smiles, blessings that brought us tears and laughs, blessings that help us see how fortunate we are, blessings that brought peace to our stormy hearts. If we were to name all your blessings, we might need more than 24 hours today. Your unfailing love for each one of us is so great that words are not enough to express our gratitude. We humbly ask that you receive the music that is within our hearts when we are filled with joy every time we see or acknowledge your goodness and compassion. Father, in a world that is being shaken by wars and hate, we pray for peace. We pray for the people in Gaza, in Ukraine, and wherever innocent lives are forced to flee or die. We pray for love over violence, for kindness over self-righteousness, and for compassion over sentiments, wrong sentiments of patriotism. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are seeking employment, for those looking for shelter, for those living in hunger, and those that are homeless. We thank you for the different organizations in our neighborhood and city that run programs to assist people in need, new immigrants, refugees, international students. We pray for strength and wisdom for the staff at Waze, CBM, Adam House, and Tyndale. Loving Father, hear our prayers as we continue praying for our Weston Park Baptist members and friends, for those who are grieving the recent loss of a loved one. Please grant them peace. May your Holy Spirit comfort them. In the name of the greatest physician, our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for those in hospitals, for those seeking medical care, or undergoing treatment. We pray for their families and friends supporting them. We pray for healing and comfort for Karen Fox moms, Pastor Bonnie, Bernice, Tom, Barbara, Bob, Joan, Shayla, Gwendolyn, Cynthia, Liv, Floretta, Nehemiah, Ibis, Merle, Eleanor, Shirley, John Yard, and Kamarcinda. Gracious Father, we pray for safety for those traveling this season, and we pray for strength for those among us carrying unspoken challenges in their lives. This winter, we are reminded that things might appear lifeless or dormant, yet like some trees, they might be preparing to flourish or give fruits. As it is written in your word, there is a season and a time for everything. So may your Holy Spirit provide us with the strength, wisdom, and understanding to overcome our challenges. May the love of our Lord and Savior gives us the courage to forgive and to extend kindness. May we, your children, share your blessings with those around us. Our loving Father, thank you for being near to us and revealing yourself to us. As one body, we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning and Happy New Year. Today's reading is taken from Matthew 2, verse 1 to 15. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, 
Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I call my son. There ends the reading, Matthew 2, 1 to 15. <clears throat> well, once again, today we finish our series on Advent, thinking of the nearness of God, the nearness of God in Christ, the fact that God is a near God, He's not a distant God, and He doesn't want a long-distant relationship, He wants truly a relationship that is close, that is intimate. That's, that's the whole reason behind Jesus' coming, to know us in a deep, personal way, for God to know us that way, and for us then to live in solidarity with Him. So that's, that's the story of Advent. <clears throat> Today we, we finish, and we're going to look, as Leslie just read, the text from Matthew. We haven't considered Matthew's gospel yet, as you know, each of the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, speak about Christ and God in different ways. And, you know, Matthew particularly is presenting Jesus as the king. That's a big theme for this writer, the king, the shepherd king. And so this text from Micah references Christ coming as shepherd. So he's not coming as mighty despot. He is not coming as the mighty ruler that is going to treat people in a challenging way, in a difficult way. Rather, he comes as our shepherd king. That's the emphasis in the book of Micah that's quoted there. So the beginning, the ending of Advent, and the beginning of a new year. So uh, I don't know. Do you guys, do you make notes and reflect on the end of a year and beginning a new one? Anybody take a journal and write things down? Probably, right? You probably do something like that. Maybe make a list of sticky notes, put them on your fridge. I don't know. Do you do that? What you want to do, where you want to go, what you want to be in terms of your relationship with the Lord. So that's all part of this uh, Sunday, December 31. So I'll reread a few verses here for us. In the time of King Herod, 
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. So that text introduces the story. And so we'll just think about the various actors here, King Herod. So Herod, Herod the Great is his name, and he's one of actually six Herods that are referenced in the New Testament. And so there's a Herodian dynasty that lasts for some 150 years. And Herod the Great is the, be, is the beginning of that. The other Herod we know a little bit more about is Herod Antipas, which is uh, one of the sons of Herod the Great, who is the ruler of Galilee in the time of Jesus as an adult. Herod wants Christ to come before him, right, to have an interview with him. That's Herod Antipas. Herod the Great was a, an appointee of the Roman Empire. So he, he's half Jewish, actually, and he is appointed by Caesar to be the ruler of Palestine, which we very much hear in our news today. But because he's an appointee, he's a political figure, if you like, then he always feels vulnerable. Because he is totally under Caesar and the whims of Caesar. And at any given time, Caesar can say, well, that's it for Herod the Great. Herod, you wouldn't call him Herod the Great. And that's the end of his rule. So you can imagine then when the Magi from the East come and start asking about this newborn baby who was the king of the Jews, that this would be upsetting for Herod. He would wonder about that. He would be fearful about that. And the text tells us that he was fearful. He's driven by power, a lust for power, and the fear of losing it, as we have here. And we can think of rulers in our world today, despots who function very much the same way. There's a lust for power. More than anything else, they want the power. And then, of course, they're afraid that they might lose it. Everybody loses it somewhere along the line. And so they're very much conscious of that. I was thinking of the ruler in North Korea today, Kim, reading up a little bit about him. Didn't know that he was actually schooled in Switzerland, he and his family. So in spite of his partisanship for North Korea, he was schooled in Europe. And he actually loved basketball. One of his great fans was he was an aficionado of NBA basketball, and he loved Michael Jordan. He would do sketches of Jordan over and over and over again. Just an ordinary guy, really, <clears throat> student, just like so many other students. Happened to be born into a family that had power in North Korea, and that's where he is now. And it seems that lust for power is what drives him. And clearly, he's afraid of losing it. He had his brother killed, apparently. So you can imagine. So he's just one example of, of all around the world. So Herod, this is the type of man that is in power in Palestine when Jesus is born. So we keep him in mind, King Herod. Then we have the Magi. So the Magi come from the east. It's no more specific than that. But they are astrologers. <clears throat> and so we know that astrology was a, a very big science in Babylon and Persia in the, in the centuries, those centuries, first century. Prior to that, they really did an analysis of the sky. And it would make sense because the sky is permanent and it moves in a consistent way. So if you go you know, outside of town and you see the Milky Way, here in this time of year, the Milky Way is right up there, it's big. Well, I mean, it's the same sky that Christ was looking at, Herod was looking at, it's there. And it moves consistently. In the odd times, something new happens. And so, in the day, then, studying the 
sphere of the stars made sense and they analyzed it and were very aware of the planets and the constellations and how they moved. And so what constellation was in the sky particularly when you were born that day? I mean, we might think today of astrology as, you know, just like a pseudo whatever. Doesn't mean anything. But 2,000 years ago in the day, it would have actually meant quite a bit. And so the Magi come and they study the sky. And something has happened in the sky that takes their attention. And biblical scholars have worked at that and <clears throat> determined and looked back at the science and so on. And there was actually a conjunction, two stars, planets actually, Saturn and Jupiter, kind of met in the sky at that time in a, in a way that was quite rare. It only happens every hundreds of years. And it was there. Some have suggested, well, maybe that's what they saw. They saw something in the sky they called the star. Maybe it was those two planets coming together. I don't know. But something got their attention. And so they travel all the way from the east. Let's say it's Babylon, Persia. They aren't Jews. They're Gentiles. But they know something about the Jewish faith. That would make sense if you were in Babylon and Persia because the people were in exile in that area. So there's some sort of awareness. Something happens in the sky, and they set off for Palestine, Judea, because they have an inkling that it's connected there. And so they make their way, following the star. So we can't quite imagine how all that works, but that's, that's them. Coming hundreds of miles over tough terrain, making their way to the city of Jerusalem. And that's where they make their inquiries. So those are the second group of characters. Thirdly, we have the chief priests and scribes. Chief priests and scribes are the leaders of the religious establishment in Jerusalem, in the country, in that day. And they study the scriptures. And so when the Magi come and they make uh, inquiries about this new king, Herod decides, well, we better find out where this king is born. So he brings the PhDs of the day together, and they are the, the key scholars there in the city of Jerusalem, and they say, well, he will be born, they do their studies, in Bethlehem. Ma Micah, the book of Micah, cites it, and that was the text that we just read. He will be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is only about five miles away from Jerusalem. There they go. And we note that it will be the king, the king of the Jews, the shepherd king. He will be the one that will be born. So Herod says to the Magi, well, you go. Find the king and come back and tell me about it. And of course, we know the deeper response of resistance with Herod that we'll look at in a moment. So just off the top, so what, what do we do with that? <clears throat> well, the good news is the Magi are Gentiles. So indeed, with Matthew, this is a whole new line, really. This is a whole new line of thought in the canticles of the Nativity story, where the Magi from the East are Gentiles. They come searching for Christ. And so very early in this gospel, obviously, the story is bigger. The Savior is not just concerned about the Jewish community for Israel, but is concerned for all the world. And the story of the Magi coming from the East is an indicator of that. They come searching for the new king. <clears throat> and as we say here, the religious leaders... <laughs> They are the ones who know all about where the king will be born, but they don't even get on their camels or whatever or could walk five miles, right? They don't go looking for the new king. They don't go looking for the Messiah. That's kind of hard to imagine, actually. If your whole life is about the Messiah, and then we're told that the Messiah is going to be born in a town just outside the city, you would think you'd want to get up and go look in yourself not just send the Magi. So what, it, what, I mean, what does that say? It seems to me there's a certain disconnection here then. 
that there's a lot of head knowledge going on with the religious leaders, but doesn't seem to be a whole lot of heart response here. Indicates, I would say, a certain degree of apathy, a certain degree of indifference, or even maybe they like the status quo. They like the way it is. If the Messiah comes, then that upsets things. The Messiah will have all the power. So what happens to them as the leaders sitting on the Sanhedrin, which had lots of power? Herod was aware of it. Pilate was aware of it later, right? So the status quo. So it, it raises this issue of what, what is our response? The good news is that I would think we're here today, pretty much maybe all of us as Gentiles, the good news is that Gentiles are represented in our story and they come searching for the king. So, what about us? As we go forward in 2024, how much of our response is, I want to go to the king. I want to know Jesus more. You can have desires in every other area. What about this area? What, what about my faith response? How much do I want to know God, who is the creator of all? So is it in my heart, your heart, to, to want to get closer there? You know, that can fall off the radar, right? And we want to have all kinds of other things. We figure we'll get back to it later. No, oh, I'll do that when I get older, whatever. Right now, I just want to, whatever, have fun, do my thing. So the religious leaders do not seek, but yet the Magi do. So that's the setting, right? These three groups, these major groups, as we look at the story. So then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned, and sorry, and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now, we don't know how that really worked, right? Obviously. They set out to Bethlehem. That night, it's not a cloudy sky, it's shining bright. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. <clears throat> a joyful response to knowing God. That's where they are at. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, just as an aside, the language that is used here suggests that this scene is later, maybe a year later than what is found in Luke's story. So it seems that they stay in Bethlehem for a while. And the suggestion is, because here we no longer see the topic of a stable, we see a house. It's a different word. They're now living in a house. And it's no longer a baby, it is now a child. Different language. So there's a child, a little one, a year old, a year and a half. You know there's a big difference, right, between a baby and a little one who's crawling around. But the language here suggests that. So it seems like they stay in Bethlehem. That would make a certain sense because they are suspect. Mary has the child. They are not married. Everybody knows that. If they go back to Nazareth, there's going to be a lot of gossip, a lot of talking. They're not going to be treated that well by some people. And so maybe Joseph decides, okay, they decide together, let's just stay here in Bethlehem. And they go back to Nazareth years later after the Egypt story that they will go into for two years. Whatever, magi come, they meet the child, and they give the gifts. Three different gifts. So because of that, we think that there are three magi. We're not actually told that there are three magi, but that's how the tradition goes. We're, they're even named by later tradition, right? The text does not tell us all that. But these folk come, and they want to meet the king, the baby king, the child. 
and they are full of joy when they meet the Christ child. So is there resistance or reception? That's the second point. Herod resists God's work. We see the fear. We see the manipulation because he wants to, the Magi to go. The whole thing is deceitful. You go find the child, come back and tell us, and then I'll go and worship. Meanwhile, we know that he wants actually to kill the child. Why? Because the child is the new king. We know, we know from Josephus that Herod killed a bunch of his own family. So he did that. So clearly killing a child who is a threat to him, that would not be an issue at all. So he wants to go and kill the child. So there is resistance at a very profound level. Then the opposite of that is the wise men who go seeking, searching, and are filled with joy when they find the Christ child. So what is our hearts like? What about us? What about reception? What about resistance? I've said many times that our hearts are often filled with, a, it's, it's, it's a, there's a tension there. There's tension that we want God, but we also resist God. We don't say that we resist God, but our actions suggest that we do. I include myself. We don't always act in a way that is fully consistent with wanting to know God. We'll respond in a different way. Our own, you know, our own stuff gets in the way. Our own attachments. Whatever that might be. Someone has talked about, I remember reading Walter Wangren, and he wrote about the theme of the Herod in our own hearts. So Herod is not always out there. Herod can find the place in your life, if you like. Your, you being Herod. You saying no. We just had an offering, right? Well, money can call, reveal all kinds of stuff in our hearts. We can say, no, I'm happy to serve the Lord in these ways, but I'm not going to do anything here. My money is my money, and I've worked really hard to get this, so it's just for me. And then we're hesitant to share, not just with the church, but with others generally. Well, that can be a response of the Herod in my heart. I want just for me. Or whatever way it demonstrates in your life or my life. So are we receiving God or are we resisting God? As now one used to say, do we live like this with closed fists or do we live with open hands? Am I resisting? Resisting? Am I going to resist into 2024? Or do in my heart, do I want to open myself up to God to, for him to be free to work in my life more and more and more? Resistance or reception? So the story is very much about that. So if we see it in the story, then we ask ourselves, well, what about my life, me? Where is that? How, how, what does it look like to open up to God more in this coming year for me? This is the question for you. Where do I want to change in some ways to know God more in 2024? What are the hurdles? What are the blocks? We talked about that last week, that we don't always use the word sin anymore, but sin is real, and we might use the language of resistance, blocks, barriers, things that get in the way in terms of my knowing God more. Well, that language, sin, gets to that point. But the blocks and the barriers, they're different for everyone. So what is it for you? What is it for me? What keeps us stuck? I don't know. You could go back and look at your, uh, you know, your New Year's resolutions last year and the year before that, if you keep a journal. And you know what? I bet there's something that's on that list that still is hanging around today. Things you wanted to deal with last year, you still want to deal with, right? What was there 10 years ago? Oh, man, it's still there. When am I ever going to get that together? That can be our response. So we keep resisting instead of receiving. Hopefully, before we end our lives, we've given most of our stuff over to God that he wants us to give. Not keep holding on to it. So 
So Herod is resisting the Magi, a beautiful presentation story of opening up. And the surprising thing again is that it's the Magi who do this. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. So we see a variety of contrasting responses. Just finished the text. Now after that, they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there. Until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. That's a new message. And the action is get up and go. Get up and act right now. There is no time for delay. So the Magi, different outcomes, are warned. Don't return, and they don't. They listen. They figure out that Herod is actually trying to deceive them. So they're listening all the way, and they go back with joyful hearts. They've made this great journey. I don't know, it could have taken them a year to make this journey from Babylon, Persia, to where they're going. Certainly several years, by the time they figure out the stars and the whole thing and make their way. And then finally, they come and meet the child, and they are full of joy. This great project has been completed. Wow, joyful. That was amazing. We went to seek the child, and we found the child. We gave our gifts. The whole story worked out for them beautifully. They're very, very happy. Joseph, the second character here, is warned in a dream, and he gets up, and he takes his, chil his child and his family. It's interesting, the child is the one that's first noted here. The child and the mom, stories about the king, and they leave. And very quickly he would have heard about Herod coming and killing all the children in the region of that age. Now it was a small community, 20, 30 children, I'm not sure how many would be, but lots of children were killed. Joseph would have heard that, and he fled. He flees as a refugee flees to another country, Egypt. And he's there for two years before he finds and hears another message that it's time and safe to go back. But it's not safe to go back to anywhere near Jerusalem, so he heads off to Nazareth, which is in Galilee. But Joseph, again, as we saw last week, is one who responds in faith, is a good model for you and for me. Can I be like that? Can I hear a message and, man, just work on it. Boom, just go. Just do it. Joseph never says a word in the Gospels. A quiet man, silent man, but yet he's obedient. And he responds and he moves in a beautiful way and the family is saved. Jesus could have been killed, right? In that first two years, Herod was out to get him. And meanwhile, Herod lashes out in anger. And we can think of other politicians in our world who are so angry. That's their whole thrust. And we can do that, right? We can live our lives as angry people. Self-centered people, narcissistic people, angry. You write the obituary of somebody and we say, we don't write it, but we might think the person was a very angry person. He had a lot of stuff to get together and he never got it together. So Herod stays in that stuck place. He's stuck. Wants his power, lives in fear, stays there till the very end. Very sad, really. And we can be stuck. Someone has said that, in some ways, being stuck, if you realize it, that's the first step forward in getting unstuck. So maybe going forward in 2024, we can get unstuck so that we can know God more and be in relationship with Him. So how do we listen? How do you listen? How do we follow Jesus in this new year? I hope that you'll spend some time, really, thinking about that, hopefully by tomorrow. Just think a little bit. 
How do I want to move forward with Jesus? To pray that, Jesus, I want to know you more, honestly. Honestly, I do. And see where and what doors open up for you. I believe they'll open up. To act in love. To dream in love. What do you want to accomplish? May it be actions of love for 2024. For you individually, for me, and for us as a church community, may we do so. Listening, not resisting, opening our hearts for God, to God. What does he want to do in our lives? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. choose the weak and make them strong. You heal our brokenness inside. Give us life. The same love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. The same God that spread the It's so great to be here this morning to see all these faces. Welcome Justine, a brand new person. Justine, wave. <laughs> it's her first time at the church. I hope that doesn't embarrass you too much. <laughs> My bad if it does. So great to see everyone here. Uh, this is the last day of 2023. Can't wait to see what 2024 holds for all of us. Let us now say together, especially the kids are here, let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as we, as we say goodbye to 2023 and look forward to 2024. All together now. Our Father who art Lord in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will, will be done, done on earth, earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And all God's Amen. people said, Amen. Bless you.